40 here. So just imagine looking at the Biden-Trump debate and, and thinking that it was a draw. But, but we have two columnists for the New York Times, right? Lydia Paul Green, uh, Jamel Bowie. For, for them, it's just uh, way too complicated to try to figure out who won the Joe Biden Donald Trump debate three weeks ago. All right, it, it was the worst Joe Biden debate performance in American history in presidential debates. It was a debate so atrocious, all right, that uh, Joe Biden had to drop out. And, and Jamel Bowie and Lydia Paul Green, right, the two diversity hires, they thought it was a draw. A good tweet here. Imagine there is a debate performance so atrocious that eventually causes the sitting president to drop his candidacy and you still claim that it was a draw. I mean, what what, uh, what planet do these people live on? Oh, now Trump's age and health under renewed scrutiny after Biden's exit. Wow. This They're... news story was written by Michael Cranish. Results, his weight or other key information. Right. They were not particularly interested in delving into... Joe Biden's health and his cognitive decline and obvious senility. But now, front page, Washington Post, Trump's age and health under renewed scrutiny. After weeks of intense focus on President Biden's health and age that ended with his withdrawal from the campaign on Sunday, the script has flipped. Former President Donald Trump is now the oldest presidential candidate in history and one who has been less transparent about his medical condition than his former opponent. Trump, a 78-year-old with a history of heart disease and obesity, according to experts, has not shared any updated blood work results or... Wait, I, I don't recall them uh, turning to experts on Joe Biden's obvious decline into senility. Right? I searched Google Scholar. Right? I ransacked it. And all the articles that are about being unfit for the office of presidency between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, they all said that uh, Donald Trump was obviously unfit to be president. And the only articles that addressed cognitive decline said that uh, there's absolutely no reason to believe that Joe Biden would be cognitively impaired when he reached the end of his, his first four-year term. And it's now just painfully obvious that uh, Joe Biden has been in dramatic cognitive decline for so long. And this was obvious back in to, to 2018, right? This is the Wall Street Journal on a killer anecdote from 2021. How the bet on an 81-year-old Joe Biden turned into an epic miscalculation. Voters thought the faltering president was too old, but allies looked the other way. Advisors defended his abilities, and the Democratic Party boxed out other candidates. By Rebecca Ballhaus, Siobhan Hughes, Annie Linsky, Andrew Restuccia, and Eric Schwartzel. July 21st, 2024. 9.39 p.m. Eastern Time. President Biden had just finished trying to persuade a group of congressional Democrats to pass a $1 trillion infrastructure bill when Nancy Pelosi, then the House Speaker, took the microphone. In 30 minutes of remarks on Capitol Hill, Biden had spoken disjointedly and failed to make a concrete ask of lawmakers, according to Democrats in the room. After he left, a visibly frustrated Pelosi told the group she would articulate what Biden had been trying to say, one lawmaker said. It was the first time I remember people pretty jared by what they had seen, recalled Representative Dean Phillips, D. Minnesota, who would go on to mount an unsuccessful primary challenge against the president. That was October 2021. That month was the last time Biden met with the House Democratic Caucus on the Hill regarding legislation. Nearly three years later, concerns about the 81-year-old president's age and mental acuity have put an abrupt cap on his half-century political career. They had... So remember, just a month ago, it was disinformation to note the obvious that uh, Joe, Joe Biden was in dramatic uh, cognitive decline. I remember all these news stories where they would uh, castigate. Distinguished guests, please welcome the Honorable Lloyd J. Austin III, Secretary of Defense of the United States of America. Right, you pointed out 
Joe Biden's obvious senility and decline, and it was it was disinformation. Uh, we, we we got so many examples here. Uh, his some we shouldn't highlights. look at it as anything other than a Russian disinformation operation. But it, even if you're open to it, the substance of it is still the story of Joe Biden loving his son as he struggled. And all- right. This is October 2020. Nicole Wallace giving the greatest commentary ever on the Hunter Biden laptop. Definitely Russian disinformation. All right. She's now. Uh, just a month ago on TV saying that these videos of senile Joe Biden are fake. Only Joe Biden looks good in hacked text messages. I mean, if anyone read some of what came out, they were messages to his son who was in rehab. And I think there are probably not a lot of people who look good in stolen communications that they have. So I never heard about disinformation and disinformation campaigns. I don't think till Donald Trump came along. All right. The, the media started employing all this new language that they, they brought out for Donald Trump. And, of course, they would turn to expertise, all right, to be part of the elite, to show that you're part of the university-educated good people. You have to engage in careful, critical discourse and use language as the elites use it, as the experts use it. Now we've got so many experts in disinformation, all right, disinformation experts, Sander up Vanderlyn, posted just last December that there was a well-documented false narrative that Joe Biden is senile, notably fact-checked as false. Right. The, these are people who make their living from being experts in disinformation. And what qualifies someone as an expert, you get other experts to say that you're an expert. Right. Uh, another How disinformation expert. disinformation is sabotaging and America. Usually, Barb, we talk about disinformation taking place online, websites that, you know, that, that somehow go viral or from, you know, communist Chinese controlling TikTok and, you know, them pushing algorithms one way or the other. This is just out and out on the front pages of, of, of newspapers now. And it's also on Fox News. This is the dif- disinformation and the constant lies uh, that, in the end, benefit Joe Biden because they lower expectations for the debate. But it's still disinformation. You know, I think when people hear the Mueller report, they think about what he did or did not find about Donald Trump. But a huge part of the Mueller report talks about Russian disinformation tactics. And one of the strategies in 2016 was to make Hillary Clinton look old, look sick, look like she lacks stamina. That was one of the coordinated messaging points that uh, Robert Mueller found was occurring between the Trump campaign and the Russian efforts to spew disinformation. And one of the themes this election cycle is... right. This lady published a book from a mainstream publisher with these brilliant insights. That Joe Biden is too old to lead. And so everyone is seizing upon this. And it is a classic disinformation tactic to take a germ of truth. There is this video. He does look away. But as you point out, he is looking away to troops to salute them. But instead, if you edit it in such a way, you can make it appear that he fits this narrative, that he is slow, that he is uh, wandering off. And so uh, this is a tactic. I'm sure we're going to see it again and again. And I think the best thing that we can do is to prepare the American people for this false narrative. So in other words, shut up, peasants. You don't understand senility, right? You don't understand right-wing disinformation and misleading editing. You're not smart enough to figure out this stuff on your own. There's a growing and insidious trend in right-wing media, broadcast, print, and social media. It is to take highly misleading and selectively edited videos of President Biden directly from Republican National Committee social media accounts and then use those videos to spread messages virally to cast doubt on President Biden's fitness for office. Right, so this is the woman who was in charge of uh, Sarah Palin, right, getting Sarah Palin ready for media interviews in 2008. Nicole Wallace, she did a great job with Sarah Palin and doing a great job now on MSNBC. President Biden was out there literally representing America at the G7, saluting our troops, you know, doing what he does as president of the United States. And look, we're going to see more of this. I mean, this is just the reality of campaigning in 2024. So we have to combat that disinformation. We have to hit it hard when it happens and make it clear. 
that these are dirty tactics that MAGA Republicans are using because they can't run on the issues, Lemire. They have to run. They have to use these dirty tactics like this because they are not right with Americans on the issues. So we're going to see more of this. We're going to do what we can to combat it. Uh, but it does take uh, the voices of surrogates across the country. It does take the media to call it out. Uh, it does take social media platforms where a lot of Americans are getting their information to point it out as well. And we President Biden was out. So Morning Joe on MSNBC led the way in arguing that uh, noting that Joe Biden was obviously senile is uh, disinformation. Spooked and part of it, what things they're spooked about is disinformation, misinformation, a late surge in social media. You write about this effort internally called the Malarkey Factory. Dozens of people around the country monitoring what information is gaining traction digitally, whether it's all right, this is October 20, 2020. Reasoning with, resonating with swing voters, and if so, how to fight back. The three most salient attacks the Milwaukee factory has confronted so far claims Biden is a socialist, that he's creepy, sleepy, or senile. Explain how this works, and this is obviously part of Democrats remembering 2016 and those states we just talked about. They changed late in part because of Trump activity and other activity, uh, nefarious activity on social media. Yeah, and the Biden campaign is very well aware of that. And so over the last two months, they've pretty quietly built up this multi-million dollar effort that involves dozens of people around the country. Okay, uh, that's one thing, all right, that's campaigns. But uh, when when it comes from so-called experts... Again, I'm making the point that some of this may be uh, mis- or disinformation. The, the things that they are reading. I, under, I respect their views. A member of Congress, I would hope, would have independent views. That's what our Congress is for. So uh, I, I'm not criticizing them for their views. I'm just saying as a party, as a Democratic Party, and I am a member of the Democratic Party, uh, we have to have a plan B if, if this action that Okay, what's uh, going on right now? Let's get Concerning. a burst from... Yeah, I'll say. And look, you would think the White House, Laura, would have at least sent him out walking across the beach with one of those killer dogs of his just to show that he's ambulatory. Then his brother, Frank Biden, said this to CBS. He said, I'm incredibly proud of my brother. Selfishly, I will have him back to enjoy whatever time we have left. We asked him whether he feels that his brother's overall health and vitality played a major role in this decision. And he says, in my humble opinion, absolutely. What? Uh, look, listen to that line, Laura. Enjoy whatever time we have left. What does that mean? Of course, mm. the Biden team then came out and said, Frank Biden struggles with alcoholism. Ignore whatever he had to say. It's completely untrue. But look, he called in today to Kamala Harris's rally. Why can't we see Joe Biden? He doesn't have Zoom in Rehoboth. He was like the ghost of elections. Right. So it's important to, to remember all, all the lines that we had. All right. Let's get uh, okay. uh, there more could from be Jane Harmon. The point. That some of this may be uh, mis or disinformation. The the things that they are reading. Wait, I already got that. Again, I'm making. I already got you I under, on there. I was, one more point. Okay. Uh, there could be malign influence in all this. Disinformation, misinformation, me, me, much of it or some of it coming from foreign sources. Uh, I've talked to some very senior people in the administration. Right. That the experts. This may be possible. I hope that if this is discovered, uh, the facts about it are put out. And don't think it will stop necessarily, even if Biden is pushed out. All right, that's Respect a distinguished views. former Member congresswoman. Congress, I would hope right, uh, would Jane have Harman. independent views. That's what. Stop. Our con- right. Is it disinformation that Obama led a senile Joe Biden off stage? Uh, you can, you can see Biden like taking, getting taken by the hand by Barack Obama to. Help him off stage as, as Joe Biden freezes up. Ah, Joe has Biden. been portrayed Smock by his attack. political opponents and even some of his allies as too old to be president. I'm not asking for your political opinion here, but how does he seem to you? Look, at, uh, I'm, I'm not going to comment. I didn't comment on the former president's uh, mental health, physical health, and, and, and I'm not going to comment on the current president's mental health. Wait, you did comment on Donald Trump's mental health. That's that's insane. Health and physical health. I think that's highly inappropriate for the uh, senior officer of the United States military to, to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would just tell you that uh, I meet frequently with the president, um, and every single time I meet with him, um, he, he is just fine. 
how people interpret that is up to them, but uh, it's just fine. I, I engage with him frequently and, and uh, alert, sound, uh, that does his Mayley homework, reads the papers, lying too. Uh, re reads all the read-ahead material, uh, Head of the and is Joint very, very engaging in, in uh, uh, issues of very serious matters of war and peace and life and death. So if the American people are worried about an individual um, who, who is you know, someone who's making decisions of war and peace and uh, has access to, you know, makes the decisions of nuclear weapons and that sort of thing, uh, I think they can rest easy. So every single expert opinion I could find on Google Scholar regarding Joe Biden's cognitive abilities said uh, we got nothing to worry about, essentially that Joe Biden is as sharp as a tack. Uh, so morning, Joe, if you can't anyway. handle the truth. Start your tape right now because I'm about to tell you the truth. And F you if you can't handle the truth. Yeah, this version of Biden is the best Biden ever. He no lost. He knew so long as he was denied. In fact, I think he's better than he's ever been. President Biden has a photographic memory. His understanding and mastery of a complicated geopolitical situation is remarkable. He is sharp intensely probing and detail-oriented and focused. Jackie, are you here? Where's Jackie? I didn't think she was, she was going to be here. I was sitting, you know, of two feet from him across the table, and he was, you know, intense. He had trouble walking sometimes? Yeah, so did FDR. He wanted GD war. But he's totally focused. He's very sharp. They say he's sharp in meetings and so on. Very lucid, well, very well informed. Biden is stately and he comes with gravitas. There hasn't been, as far as I know, a single claim that Biden made a mistake. Ageism is an issue. Americans have a rich history of holding people's physical characteristics against them. Okay, you can ask African-Americans. He's older. That doesn't mean that he is... Un okay, f physical characteristics. So if you're infirm, right, that's not just a physical characteristic. That's also going to affect your thinking. Your brain operates in your body. What's going on in your body affects your mind. I mean, just this shameless lying by the news media and our experts. Unfit, and there's a lot of ageism there. Now this age attack, this obsession by the right. So if you don't accept that there's any such moral category as ageism, you're gonna see these things a lot more clearly. Joe Biden may not be able to speak for himself the way that he used to. They wanna to think to, is to take on government if we get out of line, which they're talking again about. And how he, and that's him, him lying around. I think people should be speaking up for Joe Biden. Americans and reporters in the media are just judging him by a physical appearance, and it's horribly unfair. Age is an asset. I, I can't imagine going through life without judging on people's physical appearance. You would be so handicapped, right? You would be so retarded going through life without making some judgments on people's physical characteristics. Showed exactly how with it he is. The flip side of this coin is that he has a tremendous amount of wisdom and experience. Have you heard... Any concerns from anyone who has met with President Biden about him seeing, seeming a little slower? No. More wild speculation from a bunch of people who have probably never been in a room with Joe Biden and certainly don't have medical degrees that I'm aware of. You don't get... Right. You have to have a medical degree to recognize that Joe Biden is senile. Right, this is the, the left-wing reliance on experts over common sense. Paid for performance to be president. You don't, the job is not a job of endurance. I don't see Donald Trump out bike riding like Joe Biden. It's the Hillary's email. All they have is that he's old. He can clear a dementia bar, and that's probably a win. The media are not fair, and they're getting less and less fair, and things are frightening. You have... You have uh, Wall Street Journal running a horribly sourced piece saying that Biden is unfit. Do be a Wall Street Journal report about the president's acuity. Shoddy story by the Wall Street Journal uh, questioning Biden's mental fitness. Wall Street Journal story had a lot of flaws, as you said. But Sinclair, they didn't do any original reporting. They didn't follow up. They didn't do any work. Here is the day is Hirsch Gold, Goldberg Poland is, is still... He, he is not here with us, but he's still being held by Hamas. But a huge part of the Mueller report talks about Russian disinformation tactics. And one of the themes this election cycle is that Joe Biden is too old to lead. And so everyone is seizing upon this. And it is a classic disinformation tactic. And I think the best thing that we can do is to... Yeah, just, uh, just disinformation, man. Right. 
uh, all these calls for expertise, guys. You got to you got to wait for the experts to to weigh in and tell you what your lying eyes are deceiving you about. Grown from a murmur among allies who said they believed or hoped they were catching the president on a bad day to a deafening roar as many of those same allies called on him to step aside in the wake of his disastrous June 27th debate performance. On Sunday, Biden announced he was withdrawing from the presidential race, an unparalleled step that leaves Democrats without a nominee less than four months before Election Day. Biden endorsed Vice President Kamala Harris to take his place, but it remains to be seen if voters rally behind her. How the Democratic Party came to the brink of nominating a candidate with an obvious flaw is a story of allies eager to look the other way. So what should we expect from the news? Because if you want the score of last night's baseball game, you're going to find that accurately in in the news. If you want uh, to find out how the Dow Jones ended today, all right, you're going to find that in the news. So there are plenty of ways where the news is accurate. I remember Richard Hananya. Back in January of 2023, when I was still in Australia, he published a provocative essay, Why the Media is Honest and Good. And and to me, that's like arguing that uh, politicians or corporations or clergy or South Africans or Australians or Jews are honest and good, right? Some are, some aren't. Some are in certain situations and not in other situations, right? A, A wiser question is to ask, where is the media honest and good? Because nobody is honest and good, period. All right? Morality and truth-telling and competence are domain-specific. So news is a great definition by a scholar of the news media. The passage of bureaucratically recognized events through administrative procedures. So the news media didn't want to state that uh, Donald Trump was the subject of an assassination attempt until you had the passage of bureaucratically recognized events through administrative procedures. In other words, until a law enforcement agency had conducted some investigation and come out and said that there was an assassination attempt on Donald Trump. Right? Until uh, someone has come out who's an expert, all right, a bureaucracy, some bureaucratic procedure, uh, only then can we accept that something has truly happened? Smashed and grabbed 14 million votes from Biden and then just redistributed them to Harris. She didn't earn this, she inherited it. And Americans aren't hot on airs. They like self-made men and women. They're brainwashing us. We know they're brainwashing us, but they don't think we know. The Wall Street Journal out with a massive report today that Washington insiders and foreign diplomats have known Biden was comatose for years and worked around the clock to hide it from you. Biden hasn't met with House Democrats about legislation for three years. He hasn't held a cabinet meeting in almost a year. Foreign dignitaries say Biden had to bail out in the middle of meetings. Donors saying he'd tell the same story two times. If you tried to speak out, you were threatened and blackballed. The strategy was ignore the problem, nothing to see here, and run out the clock. Joe Biden wasn't even a part of the Biden administration. He was just a prop while his lieutenants ran the executive branch. He didn't even know his Secret Service director was a woman. It's the biggest cover-up in American history. They rigged the primary, then detonated Joe at the debate and played shock that he was shot. Putin knew he was shot. He met with Biden one-on-one in 21, sized him up. A few months later, he invades Ukraine. He took advantage of him. So did the mega donors and the media. And when they turned on him, it was over. Biden doesn't have a base. There's no Biden movement. People chanting his name, Joe, don't go. It was man versus machine. And the machine made Joe fire himself. He was the only person he'd ever fired. They're saying if Joe's not fit enough to run for president, then he can't be president. So we have to 25th Amendment him out of there and make Kamala president? She's even more radical and incompetent than he is. You're going to give her Air Force... Okay. Back to what exactly is the news? What should we expect from the news? What should you expect from yourself? All right, you are going to behave differently. You are going to give more or less truth depending on circumstance. 
So what should you expect from a talk show host, whether it's a sports talk show or a news talk show? All right, people are paid to optimize for interesting, right? Not for truth. Interesting for 100 IQ audience. There's no money in being right. All the money is in being interesting. So think of news as the passage of bureaucratically recognized events through administrative procedures, right? The O.J. Simpson criminal trial resulted in a not guilty verdict. That was the passage of bureaucratically recognized events through administrative procedures. The verdict had nothing to do with the truth and the morality of Simpson's murders. What uh, the news media has primarily told us, all right, about uh, Joe Biden's cognitive health for the past uh, five years is uh, not exactly the truth. Right, look at uh, New York Times front page stories. Right, they almost all proceed from bureaucracies. During the summer of 2020, the news media pushed the false narrative that police were systemically racist against blacks. Now, all individuals, all institutions push narratives that deserve critical analysis. Right, you need to place the narrative in a particular time and place, understand the incentives for the people push it. Most people, most of the time, don't say what they mean. They don't mean what they say. The better the journalist, the, the better the commentator, the more effectively they put things in context. And so the context was, in the summer of 2020, that about 10 unarmed black men a year are killed by police and that uh, black men are less likely to be killed, unarmed black men are less likely to be killed by police than uh, men of other races. Right, so... What you get in the news is information that primarily comes from bureaucracies. Bureaucracies are primarily dominated by the left, right? They're operated by people who use careful, critical discourse, right? As soon as you say the word senile, you are showing yourself to be a bad person. You are operating outside of careful, critical discourse. It's a pejorative term. It's a bad word. It marks you as a bad person. But there's no other word that so effectively describes Joe Biden's state right talking about cognitive decline that's not a natural way of speaking talking about disinformation not a natural way of speaking this is an elite way of speaking so sometimes this information from bureaucracies filtered through journalists is going to be more important and more accurate than what you can learn informally on your own with your own eyes and ears and sometimes it won't right the better you know a topic the more you're going to realize how inadequate the news is Right? The news is akin to the employee handbook you get when you start a job. And right? if you rely 100% on this handbook to guide your actions in the workplace, right, you'll be less effective than if you primarily rely on what you see and hear. On the other hand, to completely ignore the employee handbook is not usually going to serve you either. So to, with news, if you primarily rely on the news for your understanding of the world, you will be much less effective in navigating life than if you primarily rely on your own firsthand experience. Right? A handful of stereotypes about group differences will be more helpful to you in discerning reality than all the news and academic articles claiming to smash stereotypes. So Richard Hanania published a provocative essay, Why the Media is Honest and Good. And his subhead is how to critique the press without devolving into nihilism. Right? How many people really think that uh, critiquing the press leads to nihilism? I don't think that's a problem. Richard says, I, don't, I tend to get annoyed by people around me. Yeah, <laughs> you're, a, you're a loner. Spend any time among conservatives and you'll before long realize that few things get them riled up as a chance to attack the media. Well, for good reason. Right? In the West today, almost all institutions are controlled by the, the left. Right? That leads people on the right riled up. And uh, Hananya says, the media is good and honest. You should be glad it exists. You should admire those who work in the industry. You should, you should hope for its continued influence and success. The media rarely tells explicit lies. While the American media has serious flaws, it's one of the most honest, decent, and fair institutions designed for producing and spreading truth in human history. Well, the news media is not primarily about spreading truth nor producing truth, right? It is designed for producing and spreading the reports of bureaucracies, right? The passage of bureaucratically recognized events or administrative procedures, right? That is not the same as truth, right? If Richard Hanania was right, then the lives of people who do not follow the news would be significantly diminished. That's not my impression. Right? Many of the smartest people I know pay very little attention to the news.
Back to this epic Wall Street Journal article out today. Biden advisors who worked to stamp out doubts about his vigor and a party apparatus that boxed out alternative candidates. The result is an epic, years-long miscalculation that has Democrats racing to mount an uncertain reboot of their campaign against former President Donald Trump. The Republican nominee, who is fresh off a unifying party convention that was galvanized by an unsuccessful attempt to assassinate him on July 13. The drawbacks of Biden's age were clear to voters, with polls showing that nearly three-quarters of them last year deemed him too old to seek another term. Yet inside the party's uppermost ranks, revelations about the toll aging has taken on the president seem to catch many people by surprise in recent months. I am really concerned about what we were not told during these months, said Representative Lloyd Doggett, D. Texas, in an interview. I remain concerned about that, that for whatever reasons, this overprotective, stage-managed kind of operation not... So this doesn't just occur with regard to Joe Biden, right? This overprotective, stage-managed presentation of the truth, that is what you will get in news and in elite discourse. Whoa. Do we have uh, Ricardo in the chat? That's awesome. All right, but what, t- what this bloke's talking here about uh, the news media coverage of Joe Biden, th- that's the same as what we, we get in general. Only appears to have denied the American people broadly of an understanding of the president's current situation, but also other elected officials. White House spokesman Andrew Bates said on Sunday, President Biden has given over 50 interviews this year alone, recently held a one-hour, thorough press conference, done over 580 gaggles with the White House press corps in office. Okay, so what's behind this stilted discourse that we get in the news? Like, why is the news so different from reality? Why is elite discourse often so different from reality? And you learn a particular way of speaking that you can call careful, critical, discourse, CCD, that dominates those who graduate from elite universities. And one of the markers of critical, careful discourse is that you do not mention bad words like senile. But there's no equivalent to senile, right? It, it's a perfect word to use for, for Joe Biden's condition. So when you don't use it, you get such careful, considered critical discourse that it's removed from reality, right? There are many advantages to careful critical discourse, right? You get circumspection, you get care, you get self-discipline, you get seriousness, but you also get an unhealthy self-consciousness. You get stilted, convoluted speech. You get an inhibition of play. You lack the visceral truth that you often find on many live streams and on talk radio and in comedy, right? You have an inhibition of play, imagination, and passion, and you get this stifling pressure for conformity, for expressive discipline, so that uh, all, all the news narratives seem to blend together and sound the same. And so you have increasing alienation from reality, right? You have a loss of warmth and spontaneity. You, you get so much propriety, right? You get so much courtesy that uh, you get a structured inflexibility and and it just uh, an insistence on hewing to required rules of what counts for for proper speech that uh, may air on online on tv news shows on on the radio right careful a culture of critical careful discourse and it stifles the ability to tell the truth And it was shown most dramatically with regard to Joe Biden, but you see it all the time with regard to group differences in life, right? All sorts of, you know, different groups have different strengths and they succeed differently in different areas in life. And it's something that most people see with their eyes, but the notion that different people have different gifts, right? That is outside of this culture of critical discourse. And travels the country speaking directly to the American people about his agenda for making their lives better. He said Biden has built the most successful record in modern American history and that the president has always said that it is fair for reporters to ask about his age. Ron Klain, who attended the October 2021 meeting and was Biden's chief of staff at the time, said the decision not to call for a vote at the time was a brilliant move by Biden that avoided strong-arming reluctant members of the Democratic caucus and 
Right. They were pushing a lie. I mean, this man has shown obvious signs of senility since back in 2018. And there is a price to be paid for this culture of careful, critical discourse that uh, does not allow, you know, honesty. That, that courtesy is a wonderful thing, but it always comes at the price of, of telling the truth. And there are times when it's more important in life to be courteous, but there are also many times where it's more important to tell the truth. And Megan McArdle wrote in the Washington Post, like, be, there's a broad journalistic norm against picking on physical characteristics. And that's all courteous, but it inhibits telling the truth. Physiognomy is destiny is probably a bit of an overstatement, but you can certainly learn a great deal about someone by their physiognomy, right? The brain operates within a body. If the body is frail, right, that's going to have a profound effect on the brain. Joe Biden's frail, weak, timid way of walking through life was also expressed in his senility, right? The brain operates within the body, right? We all naturally take note of physical characteristics. The safer we feel with someone, the more likely we are to confide in them about physical characteristics. The more spontaneous we are, the more likely we are to note physical characteristics, all right? If you go to a good comedy show, you'll get a lot of comedy about physical characteristics, right? The less of a filter we have, right? The more likely we are to note physical characteristics. We are physical beings. It is absurd. It is unreal. It is artificial to not comment on physical characteristics. Now, there's a time and a place, right? Physiognomy is destiny is probably a bit of a overstatement, but you're really going to read a good novel, right? That does not contain physical characteristics. Novels are often enjoyed because they allow deeper access to what really motivates people compared to the far more sanitized version of reality that you get in the news, right? Much of what motivates us and drives us and inspires us and infuriates us is you know, viscerally too repellent to be honestly described in, in the news. And often spontaneous cutting remarks about a physical characteristics have the capacity to change our lives for the good. Right? One acquaintance of mine, Greg Kreitzer, a writer, he, he was getting out of his car and a stranger driving by yelled, get out of the way, fatso. That inspired Greg Kreitzer to research fat to lose weight and to write a best-selling book called Fatland, How Americans Became the Fattest People in the World. So you'll also see with, with Donald Trump, he's not a, a big fan of expertise, and you'll be shocked to learn that he's not a big fan of the culture of uh, critical, careful discourse. Right? This is Elliot Cohen, a uh, uh, never Trump Republican. Hey, I think well, you know, one of the things is that we realize with Trump is he finds it very hard to deal with the expert uh, and technocratic. Right. In, in other words, Trump can't stand stilted conversation from, from elites that uh, expresses things in the way that Harvard University would approve, right? a culture of careful, critical discourse that said it, it was socially unacceptable to note that the president of the United States was senile. Right. Donald Trump does not go for, for that kind of rhetoric. He finds it false. Class. And John Bolton is sort of at the margin of that, but he's that's basically what he's part of. He finds it easier to deal with the political uh, people who happen to have, you know, technical expertise, which would be the Tom Cottons and the Pompeos. I, I think he does view alliances as... So what makes an expert? Someone who other experts say is an expert, right? How do you progress in your education through a BA, a master's, and a PhD? Much of it is an education in education, learning how to play the game. And Donald Trump is less willing to play the game than any American president in my memory, right? Part of the, the game of expertise is forming alliances and forming clubs and groups and patting each other on the bat and uh, saying, oh, this person's an expert because he studied under me, he got a PhD, like he jumped through these bureaucratically recognized hurdles, now he's an expert. It's kind of a protection racket. Uh, but I also think he likes to talk big as a way of gaining leverage. You know, that's that's been part of his MO. 
uh, would he really want to blow it up if he thought talking about NATO or people were were told him, you know, this will destroy your legacy? No, I mean he's he's going to be obsessed with what his legacy. Possibly Australia, they say, okay, we got to get nuclear weapons. And so talking about one, the decline of NATO, uh, for that for asset me, to fall into Chinese hands. Talking about Taiwan now, right? Saying it will lead to nuclear expansion is a big deal. It's also a big deal if they have that island, not only with its resources of people and high technology, but just its physical position and the danger that it then poses for uh, for Japan and other countries. Furthermore, if after everything we have done and said about Taiwan, we let it slip into the hands of China, uh, then there again, I think the either the local Asian powers simply make their peace with China and accommodate it as the hegemon, or equally likely, I think in the case of Japan and possibly Australia, they say, okay, we got to get nuclear weapons. And, 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 and I think that's not a world that we want. I mean, we are just not used to the idea that you could have a cascade of nuclear proliferation and what that might mean. And I just think people are not, they don't take it seriously enough and they don't pause to consider what, what are the implications. But, but I mean, I'll just, let me just finish with this. If you give up on Taiwan after, and, and certainly if the administration were to give up on Ukraine as well, but America's- So Barack Obama graduated from Harvard Law School and he talks like a member of the elite. He, he talks how academics speak. Donald Trump does not. Word will be mud. And what people don't understand is that so much of our power in the world and our ability to set the rules and our ability to create a world order that benefits us, uh, which isn't something that Trump always understands, is because of our alliance systems. And to jeopardize those uh, is to do tremendous damage to the United States as well as the rest. Yeah, but uh, I remember when Russell Roberts was commenting on the case for free trade, the, the free market economist, and he said that... Uh, he believes in free trade because it's good for the Chinese as well as for Americans. The welfare of the Chinese was just as important to him as the welfare of Americans. So many of our alliances, you can make a very strong case that uh, they are no longer in America's best interests. They may well be in Poland's best interests or South Korea's best interests, but why would the United States not want to operate primarily on the basis of what is in America's best interest? So you see with Donald Trump, many of the characteristics of the, the more visceral personality, the opposite personality from those who populate the culture of careful critical discourse. And philosopher Ronnie Goodman writes about it in his great book, Conservative Claims of Cultural Oppression. And he notes that uh, me the medievals were distinguished not by their amorality or egoism, but by a fundamentally different mental and emotional landscape. And you could say the same thing about Donald Trump and other people who are on the right. right? The medievals lived in a society where individuals gave way to their impulses. Right? Donald Trump, classic medieval, often gives way to his impulses. Right? And drive with an ease, spontaneity, and openness that is foreign to us today. So if you often give way to your impulses and drives with an ease, spontaneity, and openness that is foreign to us today, right? you are more medieval in your outlook than modern. You are not part of the elite culture of careful, critical discourse. So conservatives have more of the medieval in them than people on the left, right? The medievals had emotional lives that were comparatively unregulated. Donald Trump has an emotional life that is unregulated, liable to oscillate violently and unpredictably between extremes, right? People who lead more visceral lives than those engaged in the culture of careful critical discourse, right? They are much more medieval than modern, right? One moment they're joking, then they start mocking each other. One word leads to another. Suddenly from the midst of laughter, they find themselves in the fiercest feud. So much that appears contradictory to us about medievals, but also you could say about Donald Trump, right? The intensity of their piety. Well, that wouldn't fit Trump. The violence of their fear of hell, their guilt feelings, their penitence, their immense outbursts of joy the sudden flaring and uncontrollable forces of their hatred and belligerence, the rapid changes in mood, these are all symptoms of the same social and personality structure. This is what happens when you're porous, right? The Buffett identity is that you can decide reason, meaning, purpose, morality, all right? You can make all the important decisions from within your own Buffett identity, within your own brain, that your rationality and cognitive powers are capable 
of sorting all these things out. A traditional perspective on life is that meaning, purpose, morality, good and evil, all that is sacred exists outside of you, and it is your responsibility to live up to it. So the, the liberal left approach to life is follow your bliss, right? Follow what uh, your head and your heart say. The traditional approach to life is to do your duty. So why are moderns more subdued, more moderate, more calculated? Right? Why do we have more self-restraint? Because we have inherited much more of this modern notion of the Buffett identity where we can decide things on our own as opposed to the traditional notion of a porous identity where what's going on all around me is going to have a profound effect on me. So we had this decisive development in the Western civilizing process from warriors into courtiers, right? The, the knight who's king of his own castle, but thanks to changes in politics and economics by the 17th century, if he wants to maintain his esteem position in society, he has to go to court. So when you live at court, that requires a set of thoroughgoing psychological changes that eventually spread beyond, beyond court and affect the entire identity of the modern West, right? And they are changes that create what we now understand as civilized. So we have the independent, self-sufficient feudal lords of old, right, like the medievals, who used to enjoy a free and unfettered play in all the terrors and joys of life. And Donald Trump is very much like the self-sufficient feudal lord of old, right? When you're a feudal lord, you're only slightly subject to the continuous division regulation imposed by dependence on others, right? But once you become heavily dependent on others, such as our elites in the media, you have to develop a strict and stable superego, a conscience through which compulsions stemming from others or your own internal drives are restrained. So if you move from your own castle to the court, right, your value now is not in your wealth, it's not in your achievements, it's not in the abilities that you might possess, your value rests in the favor that you enjoy with the king, the influence that you have with other powerful people, and your part in the play of courtly cliques. And this is true today, right? What is the ultimate source of power? It is your social position, right? So the, the modern is no longer a free man. He's no longer the master of his own castle, right? He now lives at court. He serves the prince. He waits on him at table at court. He lives surrounded by people. He must behave towards each of them in exact accordance with their rank and his own rank. He must learn to continually adjust his language, his gestures, right, to the different ranks and standing of the people at court, to measure his language exactly and to control his eyes exactly. This is wokeism. There are certain groups that are off limits to public criticism. And so you move to court, you develop this new self-discipline. You move to university. If you're going to succeed at university, you must master this new self-discipline. You must develop incomparably stronger reserve than those who can live independently. So power, as we move through the 17th, 18th, 19th century into the 21st century, power becomes less and less a matter of brute physical force and more something that is exercised through words and through surveillance. So individuals are more socially vulnerable than ever before. The more socially vulnerable you feel, the more vulnerable you feel, the more careful you're going to be with your words and actions, right? And when you have this radical heightening of the day-to-day -day coercion that people can exert on each other, right, the demands for good behavior are raised more emphatically, and you learn to take on the culture of careful, critical discourse. You have to moderate your spontaneous emotions. You have to extend your mental space beyond the past and the future into what's going on with the people around you, Right? You have to try to connect events to cause and effect. Right? You have to develop a strict, continuous, uniform mode of controlling your impulses, a, a discipline that was once exclusive to monks and courtiers. So modernity is the democratization of courtly civility and the secularization of monkish self-discipline. So we have behavioral norms originally used to tame an unruly military aristocracy through court service and estate management, but then deployed over the centuries to tame the general population. And religion becomes conscripted, so evangelical Christianity in particular becomes conscripted to serve the new industrial capitalism by disciplining its adherents. And you get increasing theological justification for 
ever-increasing amounts of self-discipline with words and actions. You get active state intervention, trying to create a rationalized, disciplined, professionalized mode of life into the population. You get more and more of these ordering impulses, trying to create a stable society, a hygienic society, a safe society by training people to restrain their drives. So the independent knight of old, he felt no need to banish coarseness and vulgarity from his life. But when you live at court, and we all now live at court, or most of us do, right? we are now part of a stock exchange in which our value is being continually assessed and reassessed. And so you can't afford the old freedoms of old, right? Gone are the days in which one could leap from the most exuberant pleasure to the deepest despondency on the basis of slight impressions, right? What, what matters now are others' impressions, not one's own. The foremost task becomes impression management, all right? The more prestigious your position, the more disciplined you have to be with impression management, self-management, the development of a new self-consciousness. All right, political standing was formally decided by the sword. It's now based on continuous reflection, foresight, and calculation, self-control, precise and articulate regulation of one's own emotions and words, knowledge of the whole terrain, human and non-human, in which one acts. All right, these become more and more indispensable preconditions of social success, so you just can't come out and say radical things such as, oh, women have no role in the secret service, right? You say something like that and you will be considered socially unacceptable. And I talked about this with Stephen J. Um, James yesterday. I to you before, in the immediate aftermath of the, the Trump, uh, the Trump uh, assassination attempt, because what I, I wanted to say that I was watching it, like my instinct, right, 